Good afternoon, everyone. Um, talk about an awesome responsibility. I didn't know those kids were going to be performing. They're, they're a tough act to follow. Um, they should have come, I should have come first and they should have come after. What, I, I, can, I can tell you one thing though, I, I bet you those kids are good readers because in order to reach that point where they could sing those songs fluently, expressively, confidently, great volume, I bet you there was a lot of reading involved. I would like to begin also by uh, thanking my colleague back there, th three rows down, who helped me with the uh, with the computer. I thought uh, that was going to be one of these things where I'm going to have to hold up the paper so you can see it uh, here. I chose my I, I changed it a little bit. Let's get back to the to the art of teaching reading instead of what happened to the art of teaching reading because I I think many of us still see ourselves as artists and my um, my goal for today is to reinforce that in all of us that we're all artists here. What I'd like to do is begin with, uh, well, I call this, you know, the uh, Common Core talk about multi this and multi that. Um, this is a multi-genre presentation. So the first genre we're going to look at, we're going to explore is uh, what our children just a few minutes did. We're going to sing a few songs. I'm going to go back to last week. Uh, was Veterans Day, and I've been working with some kids, children, and we've been celebrating Veterans Day. We take them to the local VFW American Legion Hall. And what we do is we say thank you. How by performing a reader's theater script, patriotic. We do some patriotic poetry, but we always end with a medley of songs, the service songs. And I'd like to invite you to participate in this with me. Um, those of you who are veterans in the audience or perhaps are spouses or parents or children of somebody who was in the service of the United States of America. Uh, when we go through these songs, I'd like for you to stand when you hear your song being sung so we can Salute you. All right. So, are you guys ready? Warm up those voices. La 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 la. Don't we? We're gonna start with grand old flag. You are a grand old flag. You're a high flying flag, and forever peace may you. Da 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 da. You're the emblem of the land I love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats true beneath the red, white, and blue, where there's never a boast or brag. Should old acquaintance be forgot, keep your eye on that grand old flag. Army! Over hill, over dale, as we hit the dusty trail, as those caissons go rolling along, bum, bum, bum. In and out, hear them shout, counter march right about, and those caissons go rolling along, dun, dun, dun. Then it's high, high, he in the field artillery, Shout out your thumbs on and strong one, two, for wherever you go, you will always know that those caissons go rolling along. Well done, Army, Navy, anchors away, my boys, anchors away. Farewell to college joys, we sail at break of day, hey, 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 through our last night on shore, drink to the foam, until we meet once more, here's wishing you a happy voyage home with Dunn. Navy, uh, Marine Corps, how about them leathernecks from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. We he fight our country's battles in the air on land and sea. First to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of United States Marines. Ready to go, Marine Corps, Air Force. Off we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. Here they come, zooming to meet our thunder. Adam boys, give her the gun, give her the gun. Now down we die, spotting our flame from under. Off with one heck of a roar. We live in fame. Are going on a flight. Hey, nothing can stop the U.S. Air Force. Coast Guard! <laughs> <laughs> We're always ready for the call. We place our trust in thee through howling gale and shot and shell to win our victory. Semper Paratus is our guide, our pledge, our motto too. We're always ready, do or die. I Coast Guard, we fight for you. One more. God bless America. 
land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans wide with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet home. Nicely done, thank you everybody for participating in that. It wouldn't have been great to have the children perform as well. They would have done, they added so much to that. We sing with our kids every day in our reading clinic or we do poetry. And I'd like to tell you why. There's actually a number of reasons. One actually is what we call cultural literacy. Uh, we, we Songs help us and poetry does help us to understand who we are. By the way, I forgot to mention something here. Uh, my colleagues in the back of the room, I don't know if they've done it or not, but there's a pink sheet I guess they're going to be passing around. If you'd like for me to send you some song books that I've created for my classes and other materials, uh, if you would put your email address down. Now, if you've already done it in an earlier session, don't need to do it again, but I wanted to make sure that anybody who wanted some of my material has access to it. So just put that down and, and we'll get something out to you in the next, uh, the next uh, week or so. Cultural literacy. Who we are, you know, we, we have this, I think a lot of our students don't understand what it means to be an American, this idea of culture, who we are. And I think, you know, we carry our culture from one generation to the next on the backs of rhythmical words. This song here you're looking at is a part of our culture. It was written by a, a songwriter, one of the great songwriters of American history, Irving Berlin. Irving Berlin, uh, uh, well, his other famous song that he wrote was White Christmas. We're going to be singing that one next uh, next month, which is interesting that he would have, have written it because Irving Berlin was Jewish. But, uh, you know, that's the neat thing about America. We break down our barriers. Irving Berlin was born in 1888 in Russia. His parents were at a time being persecuted by the Russian Tsar, so they moved to America in 19, 1893. Uh, he was five years old. They settled in lower east side of Manhattan where there was a Jewish community. Irving's father was a cantor, which meant there was a lot of singing going on in the house, and Irving's first uh, uh, job was as a singing waiter in New York City. He was a very patriotic person, and of course that's how he got his start on, on songwriting. He's a very patriotic person, and when America entered into World War I in 1918, he enlisted in the Army. He's 30 years old, he's not going to get it drafted, he's already too old, but he feels he has a debt he owes to his adopted country. While he's in uh, the Army, he writes a musical review about Army life, 1919 or so. One of the songs out of that musical review was, Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning, which is, I think, a great teacher song. But he also wrote uh, this one here, God Bless America, was written for this musical review in 1919. He sends it off to his agent in New York City who tries it out with some uh, test audiences, and they, they decide it's a great musical review, we, but we have to remove some of the songs because there's too many of them. And so this, although this song was written in 1919, it was removed from this musical review and it wasn't heard at all. Well, at least for 20 years. Put aside, 20 years later, 1938, 39 was along and well, the world's going back to war and America, uh, Irving Berlin knew that whenever our uh, country has crisis, the arts seem to flourish. The musical arts, the performing arts, all the arts. And he said this new war that's coming, it's gonna be a big one and our people need inspiration. So he decided to take God Bless America off the shelf and he dusted off the lyrics and it took 20 years but it, it finally became a hit. You see it was performed on this date, November 11th, 1939. November 11th, we used to call it Armistice Day, now it's Veterans Day. It's sung by, by the, uh, Kate Smith, the Lady Gaga of her day <laughs> on a radio program in NBC. It became her theme song, isn't that interesting? That's part of our culture. Next November 11th, put this song down. Uh, on, on, your, uh, on your calendar and teach it to your kids because it is who we are as Americans. You're from West Virginia, I'm from Ohio. We sing this song, we're all Americans. We have shared values there. Here's an interesting sidelight to this song. One of the people listening to that radio program in the evening was another songwriter. He lived in New York City, but he wasn't from New York City. He was from Oklahoma. His name was Woody Guthrie. Woody was so inspired by God Bless America that he wrote his own song about America. A, a, a few months later, a new song came out, and you all know what song that was. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California. That song was inspired by God Bless America. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I think you're like me. I learn through stories, and it's these kind of stories that we should be sharing with our children. 
Well, I, I can mention I, uh, my colleague over here. Is it Don or Bob. Oh, Bob? I'm sorry. He was telling me that he was a Kent State graduate also. Well, I'm not a Kent State graduate. I'm a professor there. But he was there when the shootings occurred. And you know, we talk about our cultural history. One of the songs that is burned into my memory is that one by uh, Neil Young, Four Dead in Ohio. Uh, uh, there. We do carry our culture from one generation to the next. That's why we sing and bring in poetry, cultural literacy. But our reason today is because it actually is. It is, it is. it is literacy. What are you doing when you sing a song you have the words in front of you? You're reading some of the very best material for developing fluency, word recognition, comprehension, vocabulary. I'd like to mention a, uh, a little, my own personal story. I was asked a few years ago to give a talk in New York City. Lucy Calkins runs an institute in every summer in New York, and last few years I've been I had a chance to uh, do, do a presentation there. We started this one, is, I guess, was in August of 2010. I started by singing some New York City songs. So, I'll take Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island, too. Well, and nothing happened, and we had fun with it. But I got this email from a teacher a few months later, the following April, first grade teacher by the name of Becky Awasaki. Becky wrote to me and told me that first grade, I, cha I cha challenged myself in October to begin singing with my students. We've been singing ever since. I've never seen so much progress in reading, she wrote to me. She said, of, of my, all my 18 first graders are reading at grade level or higher, and they love to sing. She said, in all of my teaching of first grade, 20-some years, that's never happened. Every child is reading at grade level. Well, I decided to, to I, I contacted her. I said, why didn't you tell me about this before? Let's, let's actually do it as a study. Uh, that we can write up, and, and she said, well, I'd like to. Well, how about we try next year? And I said, great. Only trouble next year was she had over 18 to 20 some students in her class the next year, and I was worried that maybe that's too many kids, but we tried it anyways, and well, the way it turned out was that uh, she teaches her kids two or three songs every week, and on Fridays they have a hoot nanny or a sing-along. They celebrate what they've learned. And in her particular school, they give their students the, uh, the DRA, Developmental Reading Assessment, which is an excellent assessment. Now, those of you too, who are familiar with the assessment know that kids need to be reading. We expect first graders to end the year level 16, level 18. The second year she did this, she did not have one student below level 16. Out of fact, out of her 24 or so students, she had about eight of them at level tw uh, 26, which is in the second grade. Now, can you say it's only because they sang? Of course not, but you gotta ask yourself, if this doesn't happen before, you know, it's uh, something's going on here. Becky and I actually wrote this up as an article I'll send to you. It's called, Let's Bring Back the Magic of Song for the Teaching of Reading. Uh, uh, there. Think of how easy it is to learn to sing a song or, or a poem. The rhythm, the rhyme, the melody make them so accessible, and they make, they make them easy for our kids who have difficulty in learning, in learning to read. There's many studies that are out there. And in fact, one I, I like to mention, uh, some of the best studies are the ones that come out of the mouths of children. I have a, another friend, uh, well actually, I think this is Becky's class actually. She had her kids write letters to her fathers around Father's Day and she was so interested, found it interesting because many of the letters the kids were writing were influenced by the songs they were singing. I don't know if you can read it closely, but this is Ricardo, he wrote this to his daddy last year. He said, dear daddy, I love you so much daddy because you play ball with me and you come to the park with me. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. And then he changes the last line, please don't ever go away. And then he throws in a little bit of Billy Joel, I love you just the way you are. <laughs> I always had to wonder, was she really teaching her kids Billy Joel? My guess is she probably, probably was at least exposing him to him. But, you know, think about all these songs we know by heart as adults that, that you know, they're burned into our memory, you know, and as I was telling the group the, in my previous session, what's a sight word? A sight word is nothing more than a memorized word uh, uh, by sight and sound. But put these words we want our kids to learn, to rhythm, to rhyme, to melody, you're going to remember forever. Even Alzheimer's is going to have a hard time erasing them. Now, I'd like to try something else with you guys, a word ladder game here. Uh, uh, there. Uh, so we're going to start, first of all, those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a little game where we build words, one word after another. There's a good body of research to support it. We're going to start with the word science and help me with this, okay? Take away two letters from science and make another word that means because. Another word that means because is what? Sin. Take the word sin. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I just gave it away. Take away two letters from sin and make a religious term for a bad deed. Sin. Okay, very good. Now change a letter in sin and make a kind of drink. Yeah. Sip. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's getting close to four o'clock here and a little martini would sound awfully good, but it's sip here. 
I like the way you West Virginians think. Uh, <clears throat> Change your letter in sip and make a word that describes a gooey substance that comes out of trees in the springtime. Sap. Take the word sap and change your letter to make a hat worn by a baseball player. Take the word cap. Change your letter to make another word for an automobile. Add a letter to cart to make something, a wagon you kind of push. That would be a cart. Take away a letter from cart and make something that reading is. Reading is a science and teaching reading is also an art. And of course, that's, that's what I'd like to highlight today. But again, you see you know, games and songs and poetry. This is the stuff that, that we do as families. Uh, it seems to me that these are the kinds of things we should be aiming to try to bring in our classroom. And I think we saw no better example of that than just a few minutes ago when those young children were singing those wonderful, wonderful songs there. A uh, little commercial break there, and I won't put it up there too long because the company that's sponsoring me is not that company, so we'll move away from that one. <laughs> Let's get back to the art of teaching reading. I'm a quote collector, and I wanted you guys to see a couple of quotes here. We talk, you know, we, uh, we've heard about this, the scientific basis for teaching reading, all this stuff. But what about art? Listen, listen to this quote here, two quotes by a famous guy. It's the supreme art of the teacher to awaken and joy in creative, ex in creative expression and knowledge. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Who said that? Albert Einstein, one of the greatest scientists of all time, greatest minds. Or even more, more recently, Steve Jobs. The, of Apple Computer. Uh, in his biography written by Walter Isaacson, he, he, he said this, he, he said, I always thought of myself as a humanities person, but I liked electronics. And then I read something about one of my heroes, Edward Land of Polaroid, said something about the importance of, of people who could stand in that cross section of the humanities and sciences. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. And now we look at Apple Computer and people look at it and they say, that's a piece of art. Uh, the design, the color, and all that. It's, it's, it, that's the challenge for all of us, I think, is, is to see ourselves as scientists, but uh, also as artists. How about Bloom's Taxonomy? There's a new version of Bloom's Taxonomy came out recently, and I think this one makes more sense than his original. At the lowest levels of understanding, we have remembering and understanding, of course, the low levels of comprehension, but let, let's move on. Then we have apply, analyze, evaluate, but let's go to the top. What's at the highest level of comprehension? Create. When you can make something out of what you've read, create something new, uh, turn a story into a song, turn a song into a poem, turn a, uh, a, a story into a reader's theater script, you're creating something. And you know that, that element of creation uh, requires you to have deep understanding. It requires close reading. Look what the, uh, and of course, well, that's what all art is about, going beyond what we know. The president of Harvard University, along with uh, uh, Wynton Marsalis, the great uh, jazz trumpeter, said this in an article just uh, earlier this year. The arts are about imagining, going beyond what we know, beyond the known. That's our challenge. And it's sometimes it's things that some of these scripted programs that we have for teaching reading, they, they, they stop at the known. They don't allow children and teachers to go beyond that. We need to challenge ourselves to do that. That's what art is all about. Yet, what do, we, what do we actually have? Elliot Eisner, the great art educator, wrote this before he passed away. He said, we live in a time that puts a premium on the measurement of outcomes, on the need to be absolutely clear about what we want to accomplish. We like our data hard and our method stiff. We call it rigor. We call it rigor. And what happens as a result of that? Here's an example. Look at all the, this list of terms here. Many of you recognize them. It has to do with rigor. And I'm not putting these down. But golly, sometimes we get uh, we hamstring ourselves by by all these uh, uh, all these requirements and and and, and uh, scientific ways. Stiff methods for hard data, and the result is often disengaged students, disengaged teachers, for that matter. Because when somebody throws a program at you and says, "Do it," it's not my program. Why, why I'm not invested in it? Why should I? If it doesn't work, it's not my fault. It's your fault. You're the one who gave it to me. I think cons consider this. I shared this one earlier this morning. This is a decodable text. You all know a decodable text is a text written for the purpose of teaching a phonetic element. I was sharing this one this morning, so those of you with me this morning, forgive me, but it's called Mr. Zag. It's for teaching the AG word family. Uh, and so on page one, it's Mr. Zag at the airport. He says, Mr. Zag had a bag. Page two, Mr. Zag had a bag, and the bag had a tag. And then, of course, uh, uh, we go on to OG Og. Miss Cog had a hog. Miss Cog had a hog, and she put it on a log. Uh, that's pretty much a verbatim. Uh, uh, <laughs> so he said to the group this morning, do you ever wonder why kids hate reading when this is what they're asked to read? And for some children, especially our struggling readers, that's all they get to read. Is it science? Yeah, it's based upon word families and our knowledge of that. Uh, uh, that but is it art? And the answer to me is no. 
Look what Diane Ravitch, one of the uh, uh, authors of Reading First, eventually had to say. She had to turn back, her, her, uh, turn back on, on some of the aspects of Reading First. Drilling kids on how to take tests discourages innovation, creativity, punishes divergent thinking. Lots of not so good things happen. And, and, and what happens is, look at this, creativity is for the first time showing that Americans are, were declining in that. We used to be the most creative people in the world. Now engineers from Apple have to be gotten from China and India. Uh, uh, they're, we're losing our edge. Another study found that creativity is decreasing for children and adults, especially those younger children are becoming less creative. And what they're saying, it's because of overscheduled lives, testing, preparing for testing. Yeah, they get good at testing, but not much else. They don't go beyond of what is already known there. So what can the arts do? What can the, the arts do? It's about going beyond, as I said. Look what Plato had to say. This is interesting. I would teach children music, physics, philosophy, but most important, music. For the patterns that music are, and all the arts are the keys to learning. Not science, not uh, uh, but music. Isn't that interesting? Well, what can music do? Some of the recent research on music shows this. You can raise IQ of preschoolers by getting them. I bet you these children that we just saw not only are better readers, but they're more intelligent, perhaps, as a result of that. It can improve uh, phonemic awareness of our first graders through third graders. It can even lead to improvements in uh, uh, engagement at every level. This is from the Wall Street Journal just a few months ago. John Dewey says that art has the means of keeping alive the sense of purpose that outrun evidence that go beyond transcend habit. Again, going beyond what we know. That's our challenge as educators, that creativity here. Here's a study of creativity that came out a few years. It's considered a classic here, uh, Teresa Annabelle. What they did in this study was they had uh, art students, and they had two groups of them, college art students. One group of, the stu one group of students were given the criteria in which they were going to be uh, graded. Okay, this is what we expect out of you. The other one were given more openness, okay, J just do something much, uh, the parameters were much wider. Uh, there, and then these art students created something. Then they brought in experts, and they asked the es experts to rate the quality of the work. What they found was uh, the, uh, the students in the evaluation group produced work that was significantly lower on creativity and overall quality than the students who were given the more the non-evaluation group. Well, what happens, and how does that apply when in school, when all we do is evaluate kids and we test them to death? They're gonna, you know, are, are they gonna be able to go beyond and, and, and the, the knowledge we already know? Art. Art has the sense of the aesthetic. That word's a word. And that, that word, I was mentioning this morning, the Greek and Latin roots. Aesthetic means feeling, feeling. It's something that doesn't educate the heart. It also touches the head, but touches the heart. You know, when you go to the dentist and you get an anesthetic, what do you get? No feelings, right? So an anesthetic, aesthetic deals with feelings. And that can be music, it could be painting, it could be a photo, it could be a play, but it also can be literacy, a book, a speech, a song. How many of you have a poem that would send chills down your spine? Or a song that would, you know, make the, the hair on the back of your neck stand up? You know, uh, even a well-chosen word, perhaps, uh, that we might be reading. So my challenge is, can, can reading be both a science? It has to be a science, no question. But can we also not throw away the art part and keep it as an art? And my answer to this is yes. I'd like to only have a few minutes, and I know I need to hurry up. Uh, Tony, start going like this when you want me to shut up. Okay, <laughs> Bob, I guess you have to do it here. But many, many of you know that fluency is uh, my area, one of my areas, and I talk about repeated reading. Uh, there, we know that when children read something several times through, they get better on the piece they practice, but it's the carryover effect. When they move on to something new and even more challenging, you still see improvements in word recognition, fluency, comprehension. Uh, uh, there. So it's not I practice something because I want to get good on the piece I practice. It's the carryover effect that we want uh, uh, there. Here's what the research shows. That you have students, and you see that flat line there? You have kids who are not making much progress in reading. Their growth is kind of a flat line. And they're doing lots of wide reading. You know, they read something new every day. Well, let's try something new. Let's give them passage A, and we'll have them read passage A one, two, three, four times. And as you can see on my little chart here, they improve with every successive reading, which you'd expect. But here's the key. They move on to passage B, and they practice B. Now, look at the different, look at the, B is harder than A, a more challenging piece. And did you notice the first reading of B is better than the first reading of A? Even though B is harder. And the only thing they did between the first reading of A and B is they practiced A 
So the only thing you can attribute that growth error in B is that practice in A. What were they learning by practicing A that carried over into B? High frequency words, sight vocabulary, sense of prosody or expression, and, and I think most of all confidence. These children, by learning that they can read something well, they have that sense that, yes, I can learn how to read. I may have to practice it a little bit more than anybody else, but I can. Well, we move on to passage C and we practice that. And well, what you see is these children bootstrapping themselves up to better and better reading. So that's science. And there, as I mentioned earlier this morning or this afternoon, there have been over 100 studies on this repeated reading. And they pretty much are, 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 are clear that this is something that's valuable, especially for our struggling readers. But what we have now then is, is, is this being iterated as children being asked to read a, an informational text five times until they can read it at a certain, at a certain speed. Now, uh, that, that to me is, is, uh, is fake fluency. Uh, here and yet we see it hope, happening over and over again. Inspire is an IRA uh, produced newsletter and I like it. They got great ideas. It's an idea letter but last year, I guess the year before December 2012, uh, I, I guess you can't read it but at the top there you see where it says fluency leaps forward with times reading and then you see the alarm clock. What do you think this, this uh, idea is? You get out the stopwatch and kids get to read fast, you know, repeatedly. Uh, uh, there, even our professional organizations are, are arguing this, and that's what I call fake fluency. Where in real life do people practice something for the purpose of reading it fast? We need to we need to find real reasons. Now we we know that fluency is more than speed. It really is automaticity. This uh, automatic recognition of words. So automatic that you don't have to pay attention to the words. You pay attention to the meaning that the author is trying to convey to you. But fluency is also this reading with expression uh, uh, there. And of course, the best example is what we just saw here, these children reading with expression, singing with expression. Let me share with you, and, and phrasing, let me share with you a, one of my favorite sentences. I'm going to put it up there right below the, the bottom there. I'm going to ask anybody who agrees with this statement to raise your hand, OK? Right there. Anybody agree with that statement? Well, I'll tell you, my wife does. Yeah, exactly. You got it. You have to put it, you have to phrase it a little bit. Woman, without her, man is nothing. <laughs> now, I did not change the words. I did not change the meaning of any word. But by putting in two pauses, I've changed the meaning completely. It's not just the words that carry the meaning. It's the way you say the words, the way you phrase the words, the way you emphasize the words. And this is part of fluency as well. And this is what we need to work on with our kids. Expression, not just reading fast. And think about it. When you teach kids to read fast, they're not even worried about expression because reading with expression tends to slow you down. Uh, uh, there. So let's look at it a different way here, repeated readings. But let's look at it differently, uh, this idea of performance. And I'm going to give you a quick example. I've been studying with kids the Civil War. And you know we're, at, we're commemorating the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. West Virginia played such a critical role you know, at uh, both ends of the continuum. And of course, so much about Lincoln here. We have students reading Lincoln's speeches, his Cooper Union speech before he was president, saying that let's, let's have faith. Can you imagine students practicing this and, and performing it? Let's ha let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we see it. Or in his first inaugural, the nation has been torn apart, and he's trying to hold it together. And he says to the southern states, we are not enemies, we are friends. We must not be enemies through our passions, though our passions may have strained. It must not break the bonds, our, our bonds of affection, the mystic cords of memory that stretch back to every patriot grave. This is, kind of, this is material I remember reading as a child. I had to learn to perform it. We used to call it recitation, even memorize it. But now, of course, memorization, that's, that's, that's poo poo. What we're finding is when kids practice this stuff, they're not only learning to read better, they're also developing an understanding of President Lincoln, of the Civil War here. And of course, this is the 101st, November is the 151st anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, where he says at this cemetery that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from this earth. I just read that, and I can feel the, the goosebumps on, on the back of my, my, uh, my arms uh, coming up here. Or how about the letter from a uh, Civil War soldier, Northern soldier, Sullivan Ballou, who writes to his uh, wife a few weeks before the Battle of Bull Run, but oh, Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they love, I shall always be with you, always, always. It's the letter that he wrote, that the Justin Case letter, and of course, many of you familiar with the Ken Burns uh, documentary know that this letter 
ended the first episode. Sullivan Ballou was killed at the first Battle of Bull Run. This letter was delivered to his wife. Imagine our, st our students studying the Civil War by, by finding these letters by soldiers north and south, by, by people living at home sending letters to their, 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 their soldiers in the field. You'd get a different perspective, wouldn't, it? wouldn't you? And kids would be performing this material. How about the songs of the Civil War? Yes, we'll rally round the flag, boys, we'll rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. All will rally from the hillside, we'll gather from the plain, shouting the battle cry of freedom, the union forever. Oh, I could go on and on with that one. And what a powerful, I like to say it was the Union soldiers' antidote to hearing the Southern soldiers sing, uh, to hear them sing Dixie. Or how about poetry? Uh, Walt Whitman's, oh, captain, my captain, the great American poet. We used to, I have to memorize again uh, when I was in school. What would happen if kids practiced this kind of material? Practice it, you know, authentic to be performed, perhaps. You'd find them growing in history and reading and fluency. It could even be a model for their own writing. You know, Lincoln's development as a writer, uh, he, he, people would call him one of the best writers we had with president, probably the best. And according to some research, it's because he repeatedly read the Bible in Shakespeare. And you can find elements of biblical writing and Shakespeare writing in, in the works of President Lincoln. You know, when kids begin, and just as the children that you saw in that letter, uh, Ricardo to his father embedded the, uh, the uh, you are my sunshine into his own writing. It begins to become part of us by this repeated reading. Well, there's many other material that we bring in. In fact, if you're studying the Civil War, think about those. It's just not a textbook. It's something to be lived and relived through the words of our ancestors. And it does work. I will tell you that Lorraine Griffith, a teacher from North Carolina who's been doing this for a number of years with her kids, find out that her struggling readers make close to three years gain in the one year there in her classroom. They also read faster, 53 words faster than they did at the beginning of the year, even though we normally expect fourth graders to only gain about 25 words per minute. And yet, never, not once will you ever see in her classroom, let's read this fast. You don't have to. You practice, just in the same way that you and I became fast readers, these children can become fast as well. Other studies, I, I'll, I'll tell you the study, this one here of uh, Rhonda, a, a middle school teacher in, in South Carolina. She has her kids pr pr practicing and performing poetry. At the beginning of the school year, you can see what her ki kids look like, sixth graders, two thirds of the kids below reading level on a silent reading comprehension test, two thirds below grade level uh, there. And so what every week, every part of every day was practicing a poem that they would end up performing on Friday. They had a whole week of Langston Hughes, a whole week of Emily Dickinson, a whole week of uh, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and so on. They would perform on Friday. When the kids took the end of the year test, nine months later, look what happened. Instead of two thirds of your kids below grade level, now it's, it's only a quarter. That's still a number of children, but oh my gosh, she's cut that by more than half. And look at the other end, where she only had 3% of her kids proficient or advanced, now it's their over 30%. This teacher was teacher of the year as a result of this. We need to think artistically because this is what we find is engaging. And perhaps again from the not mouths of babes, this is a, a little second grader or first grader who wrote to me a couple years ago. Dr. Rosinski, thank you for taking, helping me read better. I was think, uh, uh, I now think about pitch when I read. I also think about pacing when I, with ex reading with expression. It helps me understand what I read uh, uh, there. We talk about phonics and how phonics can be taught through poetry. You're gonna teach the AY word family. Rain, rain, go away, come and get another day. How about IGHT, Starlight, Starbright? I think that's much better than Miss Ma Mr. Mag had a bag or whatever that dumb book was all about. Or earlier we, we sang at my other session this song, inch by inch, row by row, gonna make this garden grow. Look at all the OW words that come from a song. We gotta look for poetry and song as ways of teaching reading. So try poetry. Another article I wrote just last year is try poetry for struggling readers. Something they can learn easily and makes them better readers. Vocabulary, well, again, uh, I was sharing this, this you know, the old vocabulary list. How about if we do it artfully? Look at those Latin Greek connections. If you know, for example, that D-U-C is a Greek root and means leader. Okay, then do you know other words that D-U-C in them? Conductors lead trains and orchestras. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, induction to be led into the army when I was drafted many years ago. Uh, how about to introduce somebody uh, there? Or how about the word educator? Educator. Do you notice DUC in there? 
It's a Greek root. It means to lead children out of darkness. That's what the word educator comes from. But if you know that one root, it can help you with lots and lots and lots of words there. Uh, uh, there. And of course, I, I, here, here is something. I have been advocating a lot, this Greek and Latin approach to building vocabulary. A colleague of mine in Washington, D.C. says this can be a game changer when it comes to uh, uh, building vocabulary and, of course, increasing comprehension. Can comprehension be taught? Well, again, let's try the idea of taking something you read and going beyond what we already know. How about if we had kids take stories and turn them into scripts, or better yet, what my colleague Chase Young did. He makes movies out of them. Uh, they're, in order to make a movie out of a, a story you read, don't you have to understand the story pretty well, deeply? I think that idea of transforming, creating. Earlier today, I shared with a group here the Sylvester and the Magic Pebble. Uh, of course, many of you know that classic tale, tale about Sylvester who finds this pebble and, of course, gets himself into trouble. How about if students turn it into a reader's theater script? How about if they turned it into a poem? Or better yet, how about if they turned it into a song? Here's a teacher friend of mine had her students, uh, had her students turn this into a song. They wrote it, uh, they summarized Sylvester in the form of Gilligan's Island. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful mule whose unplanned metamorphosis kept him out of school. Sylvester lived on Acorn Road, his mom and dad did too. Sylvester took a stroll one day and disappeared from view, and disappeared from view. Now, of course, they created something really grand with that and had fun with it, but I submit to you their understanding of that story was significantly deeper and more comprehensive than simply reading a story and discussing it. This idea of moving beyond what we all know. Well, folks, my time is more than up. I, I had to take out several slides. And I, I, I hope I remind you of those days that we, the reason we got into teaching, every one of us, we wanted to be scientists, but we all are also artists. And I'll end with this last poem. I, I love this last poem by Karen Durica. Uh, it's, it's about poetry, and it's, I'd like to share it with you. It goes like this. Um, somehow, a life without poetry seems dismal, empty, flat, not much. So each day in my classroom, I read sonnets, haikus, free verse, and such. An observer sat in my room one day, noted the poem's title, evaluated the delivery, recorded lesson sequence. She said dryly, it seems, there's no connection curriculum-wise, no anticipatory set, no vocabulary trill, no comprehension query. Do they even know what I mean? Those words sound familiar, don't they? We hear what's coming around. Well, I could have contrived a defense or two, but spirits flowed with peaceful joy. Honesty prevailed, simple truth explained. I, I read because it's beautiful, I said. She didn't quite frown, but she recalled all the, all the same. We've got standards to meet, timelines to keep, pages to cover, important content to be read. I looked from her to my students' gaze. They, they had relished the words, danced with a rhythm, mused with a meaning we rich, rich, richer in, in spirit than when we began. I read it because it was beautiful, and beauty is always, is, is never superfluous, never irrelevant, always needed, and always in my lesson plan. And so may we all find beauty, may we all find art in our lesson plans, because when we do, we're gonna do so much more than covering the common core. We're gonna do that, but much more uh, indeed. Thank you for your, your kind attention. Thank you for all that you do for our children in West Virginia and across the country. You truly are the heroes, and you certainly have my deepest admiration. Thank you so much.